Hello, this is Dr. Hannah Asil, and this is paper 1C of the Pearson Adixel International GCSE. Uh, this was the paper for chemistry January 2018. So let's take a look at the questions. The first question says use the periodic table on page 2 to help you answer this question. Give the symbol of the element that has an atomic number of 14. So if we look at the periodic table, atomic number is which one? You should know that atomic number is the smaller one. So which one has an atomic number of 14? That is silicon. And he wants the symbol. Be careful if he wants the name or the symbol. He wants the symbol. So the symbol is S. Give the symbol of the element that has atomic mass of 14. Again, atomic mass, that's the mass number. The mass number is the bigger number. That is nitrogen, so the symbol is N. Remember that if he was to say what is meant by atomic number, of course, atomic number is the number of protons. What is meant by atomic mass or mass number? That is the number of protons plus neutrons. Now, give the number of the group that contains noble gases. Which ones are noble gases? That's the helium, neon, argon, krypton. This is called group what? This is called group zero or group eight. Identify the group whose atoms forms ions with a charge of plus one. Of course, to form a uh, an ion with charge of plus one, that means we're looking for something that has one electron's outer shell so that when it forms ions, it will lose that electron. So we're looking for something in group one. Okay. Then he says, identify the group whose atoms forms ions with a charge of minus one. Minus one, of course, means we are in group seven, and group seven have seven electrons in their outermost shell. So when they form ions, they need to gain one electron, and as such, the ion would be minus one, or which will have a charge of minus one. The diagram shows arrangement of particles in three states of matter. So he has X, Y, and Z, and we should realize that from these diagrams, X has particles that are far apart, so obviously X represents gases. Y has particles that are irregularly arranged or randomly arranged, but they are near to each other, then this is liquid. And Z has the particles in regular rows, closely packed. So obviously Z is the solid. Now, use the letters X, Y, and Z to give the starting and finishing states of matter. So if I'm saying he already did ice to water, if I'm saying solid iodine to iodine gas, that means solid to gas. So solid, we said is Z, gas is X. Molten iron to solid iron. Remember the word molten means we have heated it until it melted. So it's a liquid. That means we're looking at liquid iron to solid. Liquid is Y, while the solid would be Z. Ethene to polyethene. Remember that ethene is a gas. Ethene is an alkene that has two carbons. And you should remember that alkanes and alkenes that have one or two or three or four carbons are gases. So we're starting with a gas. A gas is X. And polyethene is the polymer. And you should remember that polymers are plastics. So polymers are solids. Then he says, which of these changes takes place when solid iodine is heated to form iodine gas? Again, if I have a solid and I'm heating it until it's a gas, you should remember that that is sublimation. Remember all of these changes of state. A student places a few purple crystals at the bottom of a beaker containing some cold water. The crystals start to dissolve. 
states how the appearance of the crystal and the water change as the crystal dissolve. You should remember if I put the purple crystals into the beaker of water, then the crystals will start to dissolve until all the water becomes purple in color. So what is happening to the crystals? The crystals become smaller or they disappear. What happens to the water? All of it turns to purple. Do we understand that? Which process is occurring as the crystals dissolve to form a solution? As the crystals dissolve to form a solution, what is happening is diffusion, that is movement of the particles from area of high concentration to area of low concentration down the concentration grid. The student repeats the experiment using hot water instead of cold water. State how the change in the appearance of the water differs when hot water is used instead of cold water. You should realize that when the water is cold, then the particles have less kinetic energy, they're moving slowly, so the color spreads slowly. But if we're talking about hot water, then the water will become purple more quickly. Then he says, explain why in terms of particles. Why is this happening when hot water is used? You should know that when the water is hot, particles have more kinetic energy, move faster, spread more quickly. Question 4 says the maximum mass of a solid that dissolves in 100 grams of water at a given temperature is called its solubility. Remember that that is definition of solubility. So solubility is the mass of a solid that dissolves in 100 grams of water at a certain temperature. The table gives the solubility of potassium nitrate at five different temperatures. And the first thing he says, plot the points on the grid and draw a curve of best fit. Of course, we're going to plot the points in X's. If he says draw a curve of best fit, that means you're going to draw with a smooth line or a curve to join at least most of the points so that you have this curve. Okay, then he says extend your curve to find the solubility of potassium nitrate at 10 degrees Celsius. Can you see that the graph was not up to 10? It started from 20. So we extend it going with the curve until we reach uh, 10 degrees Celsius. From this graph, it is 32 grams. Your answer should be somewhere around that. Then he's saying use your graph to find the maximum mass of potassium nitrate that could dissolve in what? That could dissolve in 50 grams of water at 35 degrees Celsius. So where is 35 degrees Celsius? This gives me a certain amount that dissolves in 100. So from the graph, I have 58 grams dissolved in 100 grams of water. So how much would dissolve in 50 grams? So you should divide by two or do a cross multiplication. That comes out to be 29 grams. Question 5 says, crude oil is a liquid that contains a mixture of many hydrocarbons. The diagram shows a fractionating column used in the distillation of crude oil. The six fractions obtained are shown. One use for each of the four of the fractions is also shown. Describe what is done to the crude oil before it enters the fractionating column. Remember, he's saying, before it enters the fractionating column, what are we doing to the crude oil at that point? We are heating it until it vaporizes. So it is heated and vaporized or until it becomes a vapor and then it goes into the fractionating column. State how the temperature changes from the top of the column to the bottom. So where is it hotter in the fractionating column? You should realize that the bottom part is hotter 
So going from top to bottom, the temperature increases. Temperature increases from top to bottom. Give a use for gasoline and a use for bitumen. He gives me the uses of the others. What is the use of gasoline? You should realize that gasoline is fuel for cars. Don't just say the use of gasoline is cars. Don't just write cars. It is fuel for cars. What about bitumen? We remember you should remember that bitumen is used for road making or for road surfing. Name the fraction that contains the largest molecules. Out of all of these fractions, which one has the largest molecules? Remember that as we go down, the boiling point increases. The number of carbons increases and the molecules become larger. So which one has the largest? It's the one at the bottom. So that is B2. State the physical property that allows the different fractions to be collected at different heights. We are collecting the different fractions based on differences in what? In boiling point. We said the ones at the top have lower boiling point. As we go down, the fractions have higher and higher boiling point. This question is about elements in group one and seven of the periodic table. So he says the diagram shows two ways in which potassium can be converted into potassium chloride. And the first uh, process is when he gets potassium and he heats it in gas X to get potassium chloride solid. So which gas is he using here? He needs to react potassium with what to get potassium chloride of course, he has to react it with chlorine. Then he uses another process to get to potassium chloride. So he adds potassium to water and he gets a solution. What do we get when we put potassium in water? Remember that potassium is a reactive metal. It reacts with cold water. And when it reacts with cold water, it gives potassium hydroxide. Then he's going to add an acid to get potassium chloride. So which acid does he need to add to the potassium hydroxide in order to get potassium chloride? He has to add hydrochloric acid. Again, he's asking for the names. So give the names of these substances. So we need to write the name. When sodium is burned in iodine gas, sodium iodide is formed. Write a chemical equation for the reaction. Again, I'm going to remind you. If he says write a chemical equation, that means he wants it symbol, not word, and the symbol equation has to be balanced, even if he does not mention that it should be balanced. So what we need to write is a symbol equation and balance it. So we're reacting what? Sodium with iodine. I'm going to remind you again that iodine is diatomic. That means the I has to be I2. And when we react them together, they form sodium iodide. And the uh, valency of sodium is 1. Sodium is in group 1. So valency 1 and valency of iodine is 1. So sodium iodide is NaI. And then we need to balance. We have two iodines before the arrow. So I need two after the arrow to have two iodines. That makes two sodium after the arrow. I need two sodium before the arrow. So this is the balance symbol equation when he's asking for a chemical equation. Give a test to show that an aqueous solution of sodium iodide contains iodide ions. Again, what is test for iodide ions? The test for any halide, chloride, bromide, iodide, what do we do? We add dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate solution, and we end up with a yellow precipitate if I'm talking about iodide. Copper pyrites is an ore of copper that contains copper, iron, and sulfur. The percentage composition by mass of copper pyrites is this. 
show by calculation that the empirical formula is this. So basically, he's telling me to calculate empirical formula. When he gives me percentages and he says calculate empirical formula, what are we supposed to do? Remember, we go to, through two main steps. First, we divide by the mass number of each one. So I look at the periodic table. I find that the mass number of copper is 63.5, iron is 56, and sulfur is 32. So I divide by these numbers, and then I look at the numbers that are obtained, and I decide which one is the smallest, because I'm going to divide through by the smallest. So here the smallest is 0.545. That means that my ratio is 1 to 1 to 2, and that means that the empirical formula is CuFeS2, as he indicated in the question. Copper is obtained from copper pyrites in a two-stage process. So first he's saying the copper pyrite is heated in air, and he gives me the equation. And then the copper sulfide is separated and then heated in air. It reacts with oxygen to form copper and sulfur dioxide. And the first question is, state why sulfur in stage 1 is described as being oxidized. What happened to the sulfur in stage 1? Can you see the equation he gives me? I started with CuFeS2. And I ended up with SO2. So that means that the sulfur gained oxygen. And that means in this equation, the sulfur was oxidized. Write a chemical equation for the reaction that occurs in stage 2. What did he say occurs in stage 2? He said the copper sulfide, which he already gives me the formula of in stage 1. And I should know that copper is valency 2 and sulfur is valency 2 also, so copper sulfide or copper 2 sulfide is CUS. Now he's saying he heated it in air and that means it reacts with oxygen. And he's telling me that when it reacts with oxygen, it will form what? It will form copper plus sulfur dioxide, SO2. And then I need to check to see if it needs to be balanced or not. But looking at the equation, I have the same number of atoms before and after the arrow for each type of element. So this is already balanced. Sulfur dioxide dissolves in water to form an acidic solution. Identify the ion that causes this solution to be acidic. Remember, if he says which ion causes any solution to be acidic, it is the H plus ion. If he were to ask which ion causes the solution to be alkaline, remember it is the OH minus or hydroxide ion that causes a solution to be alkaline. So here we're saying which, what would cause it to be acidic. It's the H plus ion. State how litmus paper can be used to show that the solution is acidic. Remember, we use litmus paper to determine if something is an acid or a base. And you should know that for acids, the blue litmus paper turns red. If I were to have an alkali or a base, then the red litmus paper turns to blue. You should be familiar with these tests. Give two observations that are made when a piece of magnesium ribbon is added to acidic solution. So I'm going to put a piece of magnesium in acid. You should know that magnesium in acid will give hydrogen gas. So I will see what he's saying. Observation, so don't just say hydrogen gas. What am I going to see? I'm going to see bubbles of gas. Again, bubbles of gas is the same as fizzing, is the same as effervescence. So please don't mention two of them as two points. So bubbles of gas or fizzing or effervescence, that's one observation. What is the other observation when I put magnesium solid in acid? Of course, the magnesium will react, so the solid will disappear or become smaller. Question 8 says, in an experiment, a student adds a piece of zinc to some dilute hydrochloric acid. So we have zinc in acid. 
the student measures the temperature before adding the zinc. After adding the zinc, he stirs the solution or the mixture and measures the highest temperature. And the diagram here shows his result. So use the readings to complete the table. Please pay attention which one is before and which one is after. So we're looking at temperature after adding the zinc. Of course, if I read that thermometer after adding the zinc, this is 32.5. He already wrote before uh, adding the zinc before it is 27.0. So the change is the difference between them, and that is 5.5. The student wants to find out if there is a relationship between the reactivity of a metal and the temperature rise. He repeats the experiment four times using a different metal each time. The table shows his results, state three factors that the student should keep constant in each experiment. So he's changing the type of metal, but he needs to keep everything else constant. So what does he need to keep constant? The surface area of the metal, for example, the volume of acid, the concentration of acid. Using information from the table, state the relationship between reactivity of a metal and temperature rise. So if you look at the table, which metals are reactive in this table? You should realize that calcium is the most reactive out of these four, and the temperature rises the highest. Then magnesium, and that's a lower temperature rise. Then iron, and that's a lower. So as reactivity increases, there is higher temperature rise. State why there is no temperature rise when gold is added to the acid. Of course, he did not get any temperature rise when he added gold to acid. This is because gold does not react with acid. You should realize that gold is at the bottom of the reactivity series, below hydrogen, so it will not react with acids, just like copper and silver. The ions present in ionic compounds can be identified using simple tests. So some cations can be identified using a flame test. Some anions can be identified by observing reactions in solutions of the compound. So he's given me a table of flame tests for four cations, which are not included in our syllabus. So we don't know the flame test for these, but he's giving it to me in the table. And then he's saying, Another table shows the results of three tests used to identify anions. And we are required to use the information in the table to answer the questions. So, in the test, compound X gives a red flame and produces effervescence when hydrochloric acid is added. So, I look at that table for the flame test that he gave me. Which one gives red flame? According to this table, it is strontium that gives a red flame. So that means I have strontium something. And then he says it produces effervescence when hydrochloric acid is added. When we add hydrochloric acid, which ones give effervescence? That is carbonate and hydrogen carbonate. So when he says suggest two possible identities for compound X, then compound X is probably strontium carbonate or strontium hydrogen carbonate. In the tests, compound Y, so this is another compound, gives a blue flame. So out of the flame test, he's saying compound Y gives a blue flame and produces a yellow color with methyl orange. So which ones give blue flame? Cesium and tantalum. So one of them is present or both are present. And with methyl orange, which one gives yellow color with methyl orange? Carbonate, hydrogen carbonate, and hydroxide. So the student concludes that compound Y is tantalum hydroxide. Of course, 
that's not necessarily true. Give two reasons why this conclusion may not be correct. Well, he's saying it's tantalum. Well, it may not be tantalum, it may be cesium, because cesium also would give a blue flame. And then it does not have to be hydroxide. It could also be carbonate or hydrogen carbonate. So my answer is it can be tantalum or cesium. And he's saying um, give two reasons why this is not correct. Uh, it could be tantalum or cesium since both will give blue flame. And at the same time, it doesn't have to be hydroxide. It can be carbonate or hydrogen carbonate since they also give yellow color with methyl oil. Which additional test from the table would show that the only anion is hydroxide? Okay, we said it could be hydroxide or carbonate or hydrogen carbonate, the ones that give yellow with methyl orange. Which test can I use to say that it is definitely hydroxide, not the other? So if we add hydrochloric acid, only the hydroxide gives no change, the others would give effervescence with hydrochloric acid. So I can use that to identify that it is hydroxide, not carbonate or hydrogen carbonate. An aqueous solution contains either carbonate or hydrogen carbonate using only information from the table. So we need information from the table Explain how you could decide if the solution contains carbonate or hydrogen carbonate. So I want a test that gives me different results for carbonate and hydrogen carbonate. So which test can I use? The magnesium chloride. I can add magnesium chloride solution. The carbonate gives a white precipitate. Hydrogen carbonate, there is no change. Remember, when you're trying to distinguish between two things, you need a test that gives different results with these two substances or works with one and does not work with the other. Then the next question says, a student uses this apparatus to investigate the heat energy released when nitric acid is added to potassium hydroxide solution. So he's adding potassium hydroxide, 25 centimeter cubed, to the polystyrene cup, measure the temperature of the potassium hydroxide solution, add five centimeter cubed of nitric acid from the burette, stir the mixture, measure the highest temperature, add another five centimeter cubed of nitric acid, stir and so on. So he has the potassium hydroxide and he's adding five centimeter of nitric acid and taking the highest temperature reached after each addition. Name the piece of apparatus that should be used to measure 25.0 centimeter cubed of potassium hydroxide. Remember when we're doing something like this, then we use a pipette to measure the 25.0 so that means I need it accurately, so I'm going to use a pipette. The table shows the student's results. The result for 20 centimeter cubed of acid is anomalous. So just two possible mistakes other than misreading the thermometer that the student might have made to produce the anomalous result. So he's telling me that the result for 20 centimeter cubed is wrong. The student got 31.0, he was not supposed or she was not supposed to get 31.0. What could be the mistake that she made? Okay. This is obviously lower than what it should be. And that means the student probably, she was supposed to do what? She was supposed to do, uh, put 25 centimeter cube of sodium hydroxide and then add five centimeter cubed of nitric acid for each reading. So maybe she did not add five, maybe she added less than five. And then she was supposed to add a weight to measure the highest temperature reached after each addition. So maybe she did not wait 
for highest temperature to be reached, and that is why she read a lower temperature than she should have obtained, or she added less than 5 cm cubed of acid. So just a true value for the temperature when 20 cm cubed of acid is added, you should realize that the value should be somewhere in between 29 and 37, so something around 33 degrees Celsius would be accepted. In another experiment, the student records these results. So she put 25 cm cubed of potassium hydroxide, and measured the starting temperature and then added a total of 25 centimeter cubed of acid and measured the highest temperature. Calculate the heat energy released using this equation. Q is equal to mc delta T. You should realize that Q is the heat energy and this is in joules. M is the mass of the mixture. So what is the mass of the solution? He usually tells you that we're going to assume that one centimeter cubed of the mixture has a mass of one gram. This is because we assume that the density of the solution is the same as density of water. Density of water is one, and that means the volume is equal to the mass. So if he says he added 25 centimeter cubed of potassium hydroxide, we're going to say that is 25 grams. And then he added 25 centimeter cubed of acid, so that is another 25 grams. So you should realize that the total mass is 50 grams times the 4.18 times the temperature change, which is 35 minus 16. So this gives me a heat energy of 3,971, and this comes out in joules. This question is about titanium and its compounds, and he's telling me that titanium is a metal. The diagram shows the arrangement of particles in titanium. State why metals such as titanium are good conductors of electricity. Why is any metal a good conductor of electricity? Of course, this is because metals have delocalized electrons that are free to move. So. The delocalized electrons are the electrons around each atom, in the outer shell of each atom. They are delocalized, and that means they are free to move, and when they move, they conduct electricity. Explain why metals are malleable. Why are metals malleable? You should remember this is because layers of positive ions can slide over each other when heated or hammered. Titanium chloride and titanium oxide are both covalent compounds. He's telling me that they are covalent, even though titanium is supposed to be a metal. But titanium chloride and titanium oxide are both covalent compounds. Titanium chloride is a liquid at room temperature, and that means that it has a low melting point. Titanium oxide is a solid with a high melting point. Explain these properties in terms of structures of the two compounds. When he tells me that anything has low melting point or is a liquid at room temperature, that means that it has a simple molecular structure. And you should realize that simple molecular structures have weak attraction forces between molecules that need a small amount of energy to be broken. So whenever he says that anything has low melting point, it's most probably because of this. It is a simple molecular structure, and that means it will have weak attraction forces between molecules, and these will need a small amount of energy to be broken to separate the molecules. What about something that is solid and that has a high melting point that tells you that it has a giant structure? This is covalent, not ionic. So this is a giant structure with strong covalent bonds that need a lot of energy to be broken.
So this is something like diamond or graphite or silicon dioxide in which the structure is giant, three-dimensional structure with many strong covalent bonds that need a lot of energy to be broken. A mixture of titanium oxide and carbon reacts with chlorine to form titanium chloride and carbon dioxide. Again, write a chemical equation. You should realize that you should be able to write this and you need to balance. Now, what do we need for balancing? You should realize that we need two in front of the Cl2 in order to have four chlorine atoms before the arrow and four chlorine atoms after the arrow. Everything else is balanced. Titanium chloride reacts with magnesium to form titanium and magnesium chloride. Again, write an equation. Titanium chloride plus magnesium gives titanium plus magnesium chloride. Is it balanced or do we need to balance? You realize that there are four chlorines before the arrow, so I need to put two in front of the MgCl2. And that means that now I have two magnesium. After the arrow, I need two here to uh, have two magnesium before the arrow. Question 12 says a mixture of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen is known in industry as synthesis gas. And he gives me two reactions. Assume that both reactions reach a position of equilibrium. Of course, you notice that both reactions are reversible. So he's saying for reaction one, for reaction one, predict whether using a high or low temperature would produce the higher yield of methanol. So if I want more methanol, that means I want the reaction to go forward. Should I use high temperature or low temperature? Remember, in a reversible reaction, if we are trying to decide whether the temperature should be high or low, I look at the delta H. You see that the forward reaction has a negative delta H. That means to form methanol, the reaction is exothermic and gives out heat. And that means if I want the reaction to go forward, I need to use low temperature because lower temperature goes exo. Remember that. Lower temperature, you're cooling it. It will try to go to the side that is exothermic. So here it will go forward and give more methanol. Then he's saying for reaction two, predict whether using high or low pressure would produce the higher yield of methanol. Now, if I'm trying to decide about pressure, this has nothing to do with the delta H. It has to do with what? It has to do with the number of moles on both sides of the arrow. So, in order to have more methanol, I want the reaction again to go forward. Going forward in this reaction gives less number of moles. So if I want to go to the side with less number of moles, I should use high pressure. Remember, high pressure goes to the side that gives less number of moles. So this is to shift the equilibrium to the right to give less number of moles or to cause the reaction to go forward because that is where I have less number of moles. The catalyst increases the rate of both forward and backward reaction. Now, suggest why the catalyst has no effect on position of equilibrium. Remember that he already says that it will speed up both forward and backward reactions. So, why is it that it does not have an effect on position of equilibrium? Because it will speed up both forward and backward equally or to equal extents. And that is why it will not cause the reaction to go forward or back. Reaction 1 can be represented by a reaction profile diagram. So that is reaction 1. Complete the profile by showing the products of the reaction. Now, we said reaction 1, the delta H is negative. That means the forward is exothermic. So should the products be 
above the reactants or below the reactants. Remember, if the reaction is exothermic, that means the reactants give out heat or the reactants lose some of their heat, and that means that the product will have less energy than the reactant. So remember, exothermic, the products are down. And the difference between reactants and products, that is the delta H. Okay? You should have an arrow pointing down from reactants to product to indicate that this is delta H. Draw an arrow on the profile to represent activation energy. Where is activation energy? If delta H is from reactants going down to products, the activation energy is from reactants to the top. And you should have the arrow pointing up. And he says, label this arrow E. Then he says, state the effect, if any, of the catalyst on the enthalpy change. Remember, when we add a catalyst, we said the catalyst makes the reaction faster. Now, why does it make the reaction faster? We said because it lowers the activation energy. So, a catalyst will make that E lower. But does it have an effect on delta H? No, there is no effect of the catalyst on delta H, on the enthalpy change. The catalyst affects only the activation energy, the height of that activation energy where the catalyst would be lower. Calcium carbonate decomposes when heated. The equation for the reaction is this. Calculate the maximum mass of calcium oxide. So he's looking for mass of calcium oxide that could be obtained when 20 tons of calcium carbonate is decomposed. So he gives me information about calcium carbonate. He says I have 20 tons of calcium carbonate. So you should know that the first step would be to get the number of moles of calcium carbonate. And remember, number of moles is mass over molecular mass. But we use grams for the mass, not tons. And he's already telling me that one ton is 10 to the 6 grams. And that means the 20 tons you have to multiply by 10 to the 6. So that gives me the mass in grams. Over the MR, what is the MR? He gives me the MR of calcium carbonate is 100. So that gives me 2 times 10 to the 5 mole. And then I look at the equation and I relate it to what he's asking about. If calcium carbonate are this number of moles, what would be the number of moles of calcium oxide? Well, the equation tells me that they are equal. They are one-to-one -one ratio. And that means that is the same as number of moles of calcium oxide. So now I have number of moles of calcium oxide. What is he asking for? He's asking for mass. How do I get mass? Mass is number of moles times MR. So this number of moles times the MR of calcium oxide, which he already gives me, so don't waste time and sit down and calculate it. This gives me a value for the mass in grams. You can either write it like this and mention that the unit is grams because he did not specify what unit he wants, or you can change it back to tons. That means I divide by 10 to the 6, so that comes out to 11.2 tons. Okay, slaked lime, which is calcium hydroxide, forms when water is added to calcium oxide. Give the chemical name of slaked lime. You should know that if I say slaked lime, that is the common name. But slaked lime is CaOH2, and that is calcium hydroxide. So the chemical name is calcium hydroxide. Slaked lime is often added to soil to raise the pH of the soil. A chemist neutralizes 25 centimeter cubed of 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid with slaked lime, and he gives me the equation. Calculate the number of moles of HCl that he used. What does he give me? He gives me volume of HCl, concentration of HCl. So how do I get number of moles? Of course, number of moles for a solution is concentration times volume. 
The concentration is the one he gives me in mole per decimeter cubed. So the concentration is 0.5. The volume, he gives it to me 25 centimeter cubed. Remember that in order to put it into the equation, I have to divide by 1,000 to change it to decimeter cubed. So this gives me number of moles of HCl. It comes out to this number. Then he says, calculate the minimum mass in grams. So he wants mass of calcium hydroxide required to neutralize the HCl. Now, I have number of moles of the HCl. I look at the equation and relate it. What do I see in the equation? The equation says, if I have one mole of calcium hydroxide, it will need two moles of HCl. That means that the number of moles of the calcium hydroxide is half that of the HCl. And then I can use that to get mass. Mass is number of moles times MR, and that gives me the mass in grams. Do you understand this? Okay. A clear solution of slag lime is made by dissolving calcium hydroxide in excess water. This solution is left exposed to air. The solution slowly goes milky as a faint white precipitate forms. Explain why a faint white precipitate forms. You should realize that what we call a solution of slaked lime, that is what we call lime water. So if I leave lime water exposed to the air, it becomes milky because it reacts with carbon dioxide. Lime water is a base. It reacts with carbon dioxide in the air, which is acidic. And what is formed is calcium carbonate, and the calcium carbonate is insoluble in water. And that is why we see it as a white precipitate, or we say the lime water turns milky. So please remember, why is it that lime water turns milky when you uh, expose it to CO2? This is because it forms calcium carbonate which is insoluble, so it appears as a white precipitate or it causes the solution to become milk. Question 14 is about organic. He's saying which two hydrocarbons will instantly decolorize bromine water. Remember, what kind of organic compound reacts with bromine water? We're looking for something that is an alkene with a double bond somewhere between two carbons. So these two will decolorize bromine water. We're looking for the ones that are alkenes or the ones that have C double bond C. Then he says, which two hydrocarbons have the general formula CnH2n plus 2? This is general formula for what? This is general formula for alkanes. So he's looking which of these are alkanes. Well, alkanes are the ones that have only single bonds between carbon atoms. So that is S and T. Which hydrocarbon is an isomer of U? Where is U? U is something that has C4H8. So isomer means. Same number of carbons, same number of hydrogen, same molecular formula, but different structures. So which one is an isomer of U? You should realize that U is C4H8. I'm looking for which other one is C4H8. It will either be another alkene with double bond somewhere else, or the cyclic compound, which is uh, cyclobutene. This also has the same uh, formula as the alkene, so this is V, which is isomer of U. Which two hydrocarbons have the empirical formula CH2? You should realize that all of these have a uh, formula CH2. Remember that CH2 means uh, CnH2n. So the alkenes have CnH2n and the cyclic compound have cnh 2 So which of these combinations of answers could be correct? Remember, if you have R and V, where is R and V? Yes, that is uh, correct. 
If you look at the others, they include S. S is an alkene, so it will not be uh, CNH2N. It will be CNH2N plus 2. And T also is an alkene. The substitution reaction between hydrocarbon T and bromine is similar to the reaction between methane and bromine. State a condition other than temperature that is required for this reaction to take place. Hydrocarbon T is an alkane like methane. And you should realize that alkanes with bromine, this is substitution reaction. And what does it need? It needs UV light. Suggest a displayed formula for a possible organic product of the reaction between hydrocarbon T and bromine. So this was T. T was butane. Now, if I react it with bromine, again, we said this is alkane plus halogen. This is substitution reaction. And that means I'm going to remove one of the hydrogens and put a bromine instead of it. So any one of the hydrogens, remove it and replace it with a bromine atom. That is my product. The flow diagram shows the main stages in an industrial process to manufacture ammonia. Now, the details of this uh, process is no longer in the syllabus, but we can go through this because this process is a reversible reaction, and we usually mention it when we're talking about reversible reactions. So, first of all, this process to make ammonia is called the Haber process. So just keep that in mind. It's okay if you don't know it. It has been removed from the cell. Um, identify gases A and B. Now, how can I make ammonia? I need to start with two gases. And he's saying gas A is something that I get from air. What do I get from air that I can use to make ammonia? You know that ammonia is NH3. So, a gas from the air would be nitrogen. So I can start with nitrogen, and then I need a gas that is from natural gas. Of course, if I want to make ammonia, I'm going to react nitrogen with hydrogen to give ammonia. State the purpose of the condenser. I'm going to remind you that this is a reversible reaction. Nitrogen plus hydrogen to give ammonia is a reversible reaction, and we uh, allow it to go through a condenser. This is to make the ammonia into a liquid. This is because we are trying to force the reaction to go forward. So if I remove the product, so as it makes ammonia, I remove the ammonia from the mixture, changing it into a liquid, then the reaction will try to go more and more forward to make more ammonia instead of the one that was removed. So one of the methods of getting a higher yield of ammonia is as we form it, we liquefy the ammonia, separate it from the mixture as it is formed in order to force the reaction to continue going forward. Name the catalyst in this reaction. Well, let's just say the catalyst is iron, but you don't need to know that for the new syllabus. So just two reasons why the unreacted gases are recycled. Of course, this is a reversible reaction. So some of the nitrogen and hydrogen is not used. So I need to recycle it. This is to give a higher yield of ammonia and to save energy or to save resources. The reaction to make ammonia is reversible and can reach a position of equilibrium. The graph shows the percentage yield of ammonia at equilibrium and at different temperatures and pressures. So he gives me this graph. And he's saying, state the conditions of temperature and pressure that would produce the largest percentage yield of ammonia. So he's using different pressures. Which of these, 100, 200, 300, 400, which of these gave the highest yield? You can see that at 400, the graph gives the highest yield. Then we have three graphs for three different uh, temperatures. Now, which temperature gave the highest yield? So that is 350 degrees Celsius. 
and pressure 400 atm okay looking at what gives the highest yield find the percentage yield of ammonia at equilibrium at a pressure of 200 atm and temperature of 450 where is pressure 200 and then we're going up to temperature 450 and that gives me a 40 percent yield of ammonia so just why in the industrial process the percentage yield of ammonia is actually less it is only 15 percent remember that these are the percentage yield if i allow the reaction to go to equilibrium if it gives me a lower yield that means the reaction did not reach equilibrium the mineral uh, rosinite contains crystals of hydrated iron 2 sulfate. A student wants to find the value of X. So I have FeSO4 X water. I'm trying to find out what is X. She uses this apparatus to remove and collect the water of crystallization from a sample of iron 2 sulfate. So we have in tube A, I have the hydrated salt. I'm heating it, removing the water, and the water collects in tube B. Can you see that? She uses this method, weigh empty tube A to find its mass, place a sample of hydrated iron 2 sulfate crystals into tube A and reweigh. So we have the mass of the original hydrated crystals. Uh, heat tube A, allow tube A to cool, repeat the process until the mass no longer changes heating until the mass no longer changes is known as heating to constant mass when iron 2 sulfate crystals are heated gently they decompose according to this equation so the water comes out and i'm left with an hydrosol these are the students results state why it is necessary to heat the crystals to constant mass how will I know that I got rid of all the water from the hydrated salt? I need to keep heating and weighing until the mass does not change anymore. Of course, at the beginning, the mass will go down until all the water has been removed, then the mass remains constant. So I heat until constant mass to make sure that all the water is removed. Calculate the mass of FeSO4 formed after heating to constant mass. So I want the mass of the anhydrous after removing the water. I already have mass of tube A. And I have mass of tube A after heating. So the mass after heating will be the difference between these two masses. So this gives me a mass of 3.8 grams for the FeSO4 alone. Then he wants the mass of water collected in tube B. That means the mass of water that we removed. How do we get that? Well, we have mass of tube A and the hydrated salt, the salt and water. And then I have mass of tube A and the contents after heating. That means after removing the water, the difference between these two would be the mass of water. So now I have mass of the FeSO4 alone and mass of water alone. And he wants to calculate what is X. Basically, we said that means I'm trying to get the empirical formula. So I have 3.8 grams of the FeSO4 alone. I have 1.8 grams of the water alone. And I continue as if I'm trying to get the empirical formula. So I divide first by what? By the mass number of each one. And the numbers that come out divide by the smallest. This gives me a ratio of 1 to 4. That means that my X is 4 and the formula is FeSO4 for water. So we got X. When the student adds the water from tube B to anhydrous copper sulfate, she observes that the mixture gets hot and that there is a color change from white to blue explain these observations what is tube b we said tube b is the one that has water so she added water to anhydrous copper sulfate remember this is the test for water if i add water to anhydrous copper sulfate it turns from white from white to blue 
and that means that I am uh, forming hydrated copper to sulfate. So he's saying the mixture gets hot. What, what does that tell me? That the reaction is exothermic. And it changed from white to blue. Why? Because it is changing from anhydrous to hydrated copper sulfate, and the hydrated copper sulfate is blue. Okay, that's the end of this paper. I hope this was okay for you, and um, thank you for listening.